last week actually had considered his approach to things and we won't repeat ourselves there but if you pick up various commentaries you may pick up some sometime that would be called um, uh, liberal critics as they're called or higher critics and anytime you see anything called higher critic then it means he doesn't believe the bible he doesn't believe the miracles in the bible and I don't know why he claims religion at all. He ought to go ahead and just declare himself to be an atheist. He'd be more honest if he did. But uh, most of those fellows deny that uh, the apostle Matthew wrote the book. In fact, it seems that it is one of the hallmarks of the so-called modernist higher critics to automatically deny uh, the author of the book, especially if it's clearly said that it is. Uh, they'll take the book of Isaiah and divide it into several different Isaiahs and you get into what's called redactors. And you say, well, why did they write under the name of Isaiah if it wasn't Isaiah, the son of Amos? Well, uh, you have to ask them. They wanted to try, and there were apocalyptic writers who did this, would uh, not non-inspired writers, who would write and use the name of somebody that they knew most of their readers considered to be authoritative and stick it on there. As far as I'm concerned, the whole thing, as far as liberal critics are concerned, the higher critics are, are just as dishonest as they can be. Um, they actually argue that um, Matthew uh, collected a lot of the sayings of, of Jesus. They won't allow for plenary verbal inspiration, by the way. Uh, he then um, uh, put those together and some later writer combined Mark's brief account on those sayings and then uh, published them under Matthew's name. Well, I know if I'm reading a book and it has that much of a mess up in it, if I really believe that, I knew that about uh, the origin of the book, I wouldn't pay much attention to it. Uh, I will recommend, uh, there, there are several out there. And one of the greatest in the 19th century was J.W. McGarvey as far as challenging modernism when it first made its appearance in the latter 19th century. And uh, he was recognized even by the uh, denominational scholars as one of the best that refuted the higher critics and so on. But one that deals with a lot of this kind of thing is not a, a, a member of the church I'm going to recommend, but you might take what's called the Interpretation of St. Matthew's Gospel by R.C.H. Linsky. John, I know, will remember Linsky, and so will Bruce Stulting. But uh, the Interpretation of St. Matthew's Gospel by R.C.H. Linsky, he does a great job refuting all these liberal modern scholars. I might make this comment regarding the term liberal and the term modern or higher critic. When we talk about liberalism, usually in the church, it's from the standpoint of people teaching doctrines that bind on, or that loose men from what God and his authoritative words bound on them. But when we talk about liberal critics like this, I try to refer to them most of the time as modernist critics because they're not just teaching some false doctrine. They're denying all sorts of things that make the Bible God's infallible word. Uh, so I make a difference in in the term, as I define it, liberal, those who are loose by their doctrines, uh, where God has bound in his word. And of course, if you don't teach the truth, you're either teaching a doctrine that looses you from what God and his word binds on you, or you're binding on people what God doesn't bind. That's all the more the reason to understand the standing Bible authority, which means you have to know how God in his word authorizes us to act and how the Bible does authorize. Let me mention one more time that if you do want to look up one particular book that refutes these fellows, then R.C.H. Linke's The Interpretation of St. Matthew's Gospel is a good one. Now, um, what about Matthew and the other gospel accounts? Well, if you remember what we said last week, Matthew is heavy on the kingdom because he was reaching out to the Jews who had a thorough understanding of the Old Testament and the law of Moses. And thus they looked for the anointed one, the Messiah, the king. And so when John came, 
preceding Christ as the forerunner, he announced the kingdom of heaven's at hand. When Jesus preached, he announced the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so he is um, presenting Jesus as the promised Savior, the Messiah. That would be one way to keep in mind because he would be king and he could be king without a kingdom. So when you preach that he's king, you know that you're preaching uh, his kingdom. Uh, I've mentioned at other times that Mark basically wrote for the Latin-speaking world, mainly Romans, to try to convert them. And uh, he basically pictures Jesus as all-powerful over all things. So if you want to think of Matthew as um, writing about the promised Savior and Mark, writing about the powerful Savior, well, what about Luke? Well, I think the uh, best thing I can say about that is he wrote about Christ as the perfect Savior, complete. It couldn't be any better. Um, then John being uh, how he wrote, that is coming from how he wrote. We'll talk about that more a little bit, just a second or two. John pretty well wrote of a personal Savior. He talked about Christ and he presents Christ from the standpoint of evidence and various witnesses, some who believed in him and some who didn't, to verify and to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God, the only Savior of the world. So Matthew wrote of the promised Savior, Mark wrote of the powerful Savior, Luke wrote of the perfect Savior, and John the personal Savior. All the time, people who are teaching correctly on things will say, if you take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all together, then you have all the evidence necessary to convince any honest hearted person, Luke 8, 15, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Now, this brings me back to what I said a while ago, and you've heard us say this before, that is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptics accounts of the gospel. I want to emphasize again here there. And I know many of our brethren who are good people uh, will use it, but they'll talk about the four Gospels. Well, I don't think that's correct when the Bible makes it clear there's only one Gospel. Now, I know what they mean. I think there's four accounts of the one Gospel. And so you have the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the term synoptic basically means to see alike. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, saw things the same way. They present their material in the same way. So we call them synoptic works. Matthew has 1,068 verses. Uh, Luke has 1,149, and Mark has 661. Only 24 verses of Mark are not, they are not reproduced by Matthew and Luke. In some 606 of Mark's 661 verses are paralleled in Matthew. 51% of Mark's words are also found in the book of Matthew, and 53% are found in Luke. Now, somebody says, well, that sounds like somebody copied off somebody else. Must be a bunch of plagiarists. Well, Remember what we said over and over again, God wrote the Bible. Same Holy Spirit that inspired Isaiah and Moses inspired Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So God wrote the Bible. Truth is truth and always will be truth. No matter what men think about it or say about it or how they reject it or anything else, it's just the truth. It corresponds with reality. So if you're going to write the truth about Jesus Christ and uh, four people are writing the truth about Jesus Christ and then the Holy Spirit's inspiring every one of them to choose the words to write about Jesus Christ, then couldn't you expect some overlapping? You know, I've got a whole host of uh, history books that cover uh, the same time period written by different authors. I have a host of books, uh, biographical books, uh, written about the same person. And guess what? Because they're writing about the same person, they're trying to be factual, 
and they write the same thing. Now, some may have more in it about that person than another one would. Some may have an emphasis placed on something else in that person's life. Um, if you read about uh, the life of Robert E. Lee, that's one thing. But if you read then his private letters, that's still him writing and you're reading his mind as you read his words, it comes at it a different way. But the facts are there. When you talk about in history of primary source, you're talking about somebody writing about it. You're talking about uh, somebody writing letters or notes to somebody. So when we consider Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you've got Matthew and John, apostles of Christ. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit on, in Acts 2. And thus they shared with all the other apostles that which Christ promised to them in the paraclete of the Holy Spirit. It said a comforter, which doesn't fully translate parakletos. Uh, the Holy Spirit took up Jesus' place spiritually with the apostles. So Christ was with them in the flesh, but he's with them through the Holy Spirit. So it was even more than just miracles that they were unable to work. They had this special relationship to be able to accomplish their work as the apostles of Christ or the ambassadors of the court of heaven in writing the New Testament, if you please. Now, the other men, like I mentioned this a number of times, like Luke and Mark, wrote because they had the prophetic gift, which meant they had hands of apostles laid on them and that gift conferred to them. But any way you go at it, the Holy Spirit guided them infallibly from their vocabulary to write down the truth. So when you do that kind of thing, then you're going to have some of the same things mentioned. Now there's some unique information in the book of Matthew uh, I'll read some of those to you. In chapter 1, 23, 24, he gives the account of Joseph's vision of the angel. Chapter 2, 1 through 13, he gives you the visit of the wise men. In chapter 2, 13 through 15, he has uh, uh, Joseph, Mary, and child Jesus fleeing into Egypt. He gives the account of the slaughter of Bethlehem's children in chapter 2 and verse 16. He gives the details of Peter's confession in chapter 16, 13 through 20. And in chapter 27, verse 9, he records Pilate's wife's dream. And in chapter 27, verses 3 through 10, he gives you the death of Judas Iscariot. And in chapter 27, verse 25, he points out that the Jews requested that our Lord's blood be upon them. I've always found that very interesting because when Peter and John are preaching, they make it very clear, as did Peter in the first recorded gospel sermon on Pentecost in Acts 2, that they had taken him with wicked hands and crucified and slain the Son of God. Now, Annas and Caiaphas and all that crowd, they understood exactly what had happened, but yet they try to make it look like that Peter and John are making them look real bad because they said, you're trying to bring this man's blood on us. Well, you asked for it. You got it. And that's what they did. It's a matter of fact. And that tells you the caliber of characters that the high priest and his henchmen were. In chapter 27, verse 50, uh, 52, uh, we have a uh, resurrection of certain ones at the death of Christ. In chapter 28, 12 through 15, um, you have the sealing of the door of Jesus' tomb, and you have the uh, leaders of the Jews bribing the Roman guard. And then in chapter 16, 18, and chapter 18, verse 17, uh, it's Matthew alone that mentions the church. And 10 of his parables and three of his miracles are unique to Matthew. So those are some interesting things. And somebody says, well, I thought you said the Holy Spirit guided them and they all wrote the same thing because they were writing the same truth. Also mentioned they had some unique things about them. 
But you got to remember, you don't have the complete gospel account if you just read one gospel. God never meant for you to read Matthew and forget the other three. The totality of the information that God wants you to know about the singular uh, gospel or life of Christ is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, if you want to see more about this kind of thing, get McGarvey's uh, book on the fourfold gospel. And you can see then, because he's already done the work for you, where these different things are, are covered in the books and where one covered it and the others didn't and that kind of thing. Um, there is out there among people some discussion of, well, Matthew wrote this in Hebrew first and then it was translated into Greek. Um, this all comes from the so-called church fathers uh, after the first century. A fellow by the name of Papias wrote, quote, Matthew composed the Logia, the Hebrew tongue, end quote. Uh, Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, according to Irenaeus. Uh, well, here's my view of that. On the day of Pentecost, they're preaching the gospel. Yet they're all preaching it in different tongues of the people that are there where they were born and they recognize they're preaching in our language and it sounds just like they're from our hometown. Now that's, those are inspired translations. And it's the only place I know that you can read of that except that you had the gift of tongues, which meant that by the language of the apostle's hand, you could have the gift to speak in any language necessary wherever you were. Now, Bruce and I and John have traveled some places, and I'm sure it came to mind how wonderful it would be when you're in Philippines and whatever dialect they're in, the majority dialect is Tagalog, if you could just start speaking to them in Tagalog. Or when you're in Russia, if you just start speaking to them in Russian, wherever you might be, well, what a wonderful thing that would be. And that gives you just further evidence why the gospel spread so fast throughout the first uh, 30, 35 years after the church was established. Well, when you look at this, um, I don't know why that really is such a big deal. If it written in Hebrew, it wouldn't have been the Hebrew of Moses or Isaiah, it would have been Aramaic. And uh, Aramaic was the local language that they spoke in every day. But the Greek world, or the Roman world at that time, used the Koine Greek, and the wisdom of God caused them then to record the New Testament permanently in Koine Greek. Uh, Koine Greek is one of the most expressive languages there's ever been. And the thing that's interesting about it, since it's a dead language and has been for many, many years, then you can know in the New Testament where a word is used, how it's used, how many times it's used, and it's different form. You can count every one of them. And they're not going to change tomorrow. And they're the same as they were when they were written 2,000 years ago in meaning. So those that want to go the route of that kind of scholarly discussion or study, then they've got something's not going to change. Now, we might study more about what's discovered in archaeology and understand a word better. They did that to some extent in the latter 19th century and even in through the 20th century. But nothing has been found that would change any cardinal doctrine of Christianity. Nothing. Any change of anything. Uh, there was a while, especially when Thayer wrote his uh, Greek lexicon, that uh, people thought that the Greek that the New Testament uh, was recorded in was a special Greek. But it wasn't. They found out later when they got into archaeology and dug into everything there and found grocery lists and letters and notes and everything else. And it's all in Koine Greek. So they could find out how the ordinary person understood a word and how he used a word. And then they realized that's what's going on with the New Testament. And thus, it's called the common Greek, the Koine Greek. So I don't worry too much about all this stuff it was Matthew first written in Hebrew. It, it, you know, being inspired, if it was first written in Hebrew, then it was, a, it was in, uh, somebody was inspired by the Holy Spirit to accurately translate it into Greek. But there's really no evidence to say first wrote Matthew. There's no evidence, leave it alone, that troubling people with it. So when they spoke in tongues, they could speak any language needful to getting the truth out. 
So keep that in mind regarding such questions as that as they're raised. Uh, there's some other facts about Matthew. He presents more of the teaching of Jesus than any other writer. And the greater part of his book deals with our Lord's Galilean ministry. Also, it's interesting to note that the words righteous and righteousness occur in Matthew more than they do in Mark and Luke and John. And he reflects a special interest in the last things or and maybe I should say, the final judgment. Matthew actually records more warnings of God's judgment on evil, and he has more references to the fate of those who reject Christ than Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, or John. Um, he sets forth clearly conditions for receiving the eternal reward in chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. He also corrects false ideas about the disciples in chapter 20, 17 through 28. He has the king showing compassion on two blind men, chapter 20, 29 through 34. I think sometimes people fail to realize how compassionate Christ was. I wrote recently that I know that the miracles done by Christ were primarily and fundamentally worked to prove he was a son of God. Thus, listen to what he says, because it's God's will. But that doesn't mean he, as a human being, was not moved by compassion. He also got angry at times. When he healed the man on the Sabbath, they were mad because he broke their traditions, the doctrines of men on the Sabbath, and didn't rejoice because the man was healed. That stirred him up considerably. The Bible says he looked round about on them with anger. So the Lord was a human being, just like you and me, except that he kept all of his emotions in flawless harmony with the will of heaven. Uh, he also records in chapter 21, verse 1, through chapter 22, verse I believe 46. The, well, we could call it various things. I'll call it the king's challenge to Jerusalem in those passages, chapter 21, 1 through 22, 46. He has, um, you have his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, chapter 21, 1 through 11. He cleanses the temple, chapter 21, 12 through 17. And again, it always amazes me how that so many people who are so ooey-gooey and think of Christ as some feminine, subjective mush pot, <laughs> do they not realize what he was doing when he cleansed that temple? You realize that was not a pleasant thing to be around when he got through dealing with that matter. Because he completely to say it in a nice way, upset the whole apple cart of what had gone on there for years and got right at the root of the trouble in among the very leaders of the Jews. But he did it, and he made it clear, you made my father's house a house of merchandise. I had a uh, den of thieves. God meant it to be a place of prayer. That is, it would be a place where spiritual things were to be thought about. Uh, he had the account in chapter 21, 18 through 22, of him uh, cursing the fig tree. Every one of these are due a sermon or a lesson, that's for sure. Uh, the fig, as I understand it, it, the figs over here, I even noticed that. I was noticing it uh, this year on our fig tree before the leaves ever came out. There were little figs showing up. Now, it's my understanding that the Palestinian fig tree, because there are different varieties of them, often has all of its fruit on before the leaves. So you'll notice when you have that account that he went to that tree that was fully leafed out. He had no figs on it. Uh, fig is an impersonal thing. <laughs> but what the Lord did was curse the thing. When they came back out of the city, it was dead. And, of course, he didn't do that just to kill a tree that didn't bear as it ought to. He wanted to teach a lesson. 
and he wanted to teach me a lesson and you a lesson. And that is that we are to bear fruit. It's not just enough to be called a fig tree and have the leaves of a fig tree. You just don't eat the leaves of a fig tree. You don't eat the bark of a fig tree. You eat the fruit off the fig tree. And there wasn't any, but it should have been. And that ought to teach us a lesson about our being righteous before God and active faithfully in the kingdom. He talks about the authority of the king in chapter 21, 23 through 32. And he gives two parables in chapter 21, verse 33. In cha through chapter 22, verse 14. And then he answers some difficult questions, chapter 22, verses 15 through 46. He also records the king pronouncing woes on the scribes and Pharisees in chapter 23, 1 through 35. I've, I find that interesting that he took 35 verses dressing them down and telling them exactly what's going to happen to you because you're not going to repent and you have this kind of character, and it's sorry, and it's gonna cause you to lose your soul. Now, were those messages of love? Of course they were. Were they going to change? No, but they could. They were free moral agents. They could have taken him to heart. They could have changed. This tells me something a whole lot about the prophets of old, the Old Testament, and our work in the church. When we live right, defend the truth, teach at every opportunity, keep our minds straight, that is, according to the word of God, proclaim the truth, work with the brethren. Well, if they don't change, if you've done all of that, you've done your part. It's their problem they haven't done their part. And Jesus did his part. And here, regarding the matter of the scribes and Pharisees, he did his part. It also tells us that you can so live in sin for so long that you can mold your character to the point to where it's not that you can't change, but you won't. And that should frighten everybody to an extent because that's the power your free moral agency has over you. And it also is the power of a good and honest heart or one that's not and what direction it leads you. He also goes into the fall of Jerusalem and the king's return in judgment. He spends quite a bit of time on that in chapter 24, 1 through chapter 25, 46. And then he gives warnings to the saints about the impending judgment of Jerusalem in the future, chapter 24, 1 through 35. And of course, he gives them signs that they could read before it would happen so that the faithful could escape which reminds me that God does take care of us. If we will love him, keep his commandments, we may have to get our knees skint and our head boxed and rolled on the ground and stomped a little bit, but we'll get through it. If God promises we will, now who's going to stop him? Or let's use like Paul said by the Holy Spirit, God be for us. Who can be against us? He gives then three parables about the judgment in chapter 24, 1 through 46. So you have warnings, the saints about Jerusalem's judgment that came through Rome and Titus, warnings about the final judgment, and the three parables about the judgment. Then you have the final days of the king's earthly ministry and his service on earth, chapter 26 verse 1 through chapter 27, verse 66. The Jews just made a cold, calculated, it's a cold-blooded and calculated plan to kill him, chapter 26, 1 through 16. Their attitude was, he's going to keep on doing these things and get us into trouble with Rome, and they're going to come and take away our place if he keeps doing that. And I'm sure they were glad to believe that because they, help save their conscience, go ahead and do what they want to anyway. Because too many people are following after Jesus. Then you have the record in chapter 26, verses 17 through 29 of the Last Supper with his disciples. Of course, they observed the Passover according to the law of Moses. And out of that Passover, he instituted the Lord's Supper. Um, 
people sometimes ask the question, well, uh, what about leavening in the houses? Well, if you'll just, I haven't got time to go into here. If you'll study it, they got rid of leavening of any sort out of their houses during the days, as they would call it, of unleavened bread leading up to Passover. Uh, thus, we follow the unleavened bread uh, and the fruit of the vine. One reason we don't use alcoholic beverage, such as alcoholic wine, because that's leavening. And everything is pure when it comes to the bread used, no leaven, and the alcoholic beverage. The uh, terrible agony that he underwent in Gethsemane is recorded in 26, verses 30 through 56. And again, 30 through 56 to record the terrible agony of our Lord. People, I think, don't understand agape love, though we discuss it much. We read about it in 1 Corinthians 13. We see it exemplified in the life of Christ. But as a human being, Christ did not look forward to going through the ordeal that he went through as far as the pain and the shame and the agony. Why did he go through it? Because love, as the old song goes, will not let me go. The agape love said, I will do it. If it be possible, there's another way to do it. He prayed to his father, then let it be done, but not my will, but thine be done. Agape love always leads one to obey God. If somebody tells you they love God, but they don't care about obeying his commandments, as John wrote, he's a liar and truth not in him. It's not pleasant all the time to obey God. Uh, when you think of what soldiers have done because they are so dedicated patriots for a cause, and I've always been absolutely amazed, and I've read many other people who are historians Say they just could not figure out how those men in the Civil War could step right out in a long line and another long line 100 yards or so away from it and stand there and blaze away at one another. And yet they did. Well, if they can do that for an earthly cause, what about us for a heavenly cause? Because we're told very plainly that when we end our life on this earth, we don't end. But how we live our life on this earth determines where we will be in eternity. I liked what he said by a fellow one time who said, we don't have a choice of when we're born, but we have the choice of how we're going to live here when we are born, how we're going to conduct our lives. You have the trial of Jesus before Caiaphas in chapter 26, verses 57 through 35. Again, you have the death of Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, chapter 27, 1 through 10. Then you have his uh, trial before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, 27, verses 11 through 31. And you have then the death and the burial of the king, 27, 32 through 36. Then, of course, you have the resurrection and triumph of the king. I suggest there's some good lessons in that to preach. And you could preach the death and burial of the king, and the devil rejoiced. We've got it done. It's over and done with. But that's not the end of the story, is it? We have the resurrection and triumph of the king, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. I always liked the statement where Jesus said, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And that uh, if he overcome the world in and the authority of his last will and testament by our abiding by it, then we too can overcome the world through him. You have then the final events of the king's life on earth in chapter 28, verses 11 through 20. You'll remember that, as we mentioned earlier, the guards were bribed to lie about the missing body, 28, 11 through 15. And you have then the Lord giving what we call the Great Commission. 28, 16 through 20. Why is it called the Great Commission? Because they were commissioned of Christ to preach the gospel to every creature. 
And of course, his account, I just mentioned Mark's comments, is that all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. So that began to work when the apostles were enabled to do, they called them to do, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you want to read about how they were strengthened to do that by the Holy Spirit, read the promises Christ made to them in uh, John chapters uh, 14, 15, and 16. And you'll see how they were able to bear up under what was almost unbearable. And I don't think anybody could, except that they had that miraculous measure the Spirit enabled them to do as ambassadors of the court of heaven uh, and just read the life of, Christ, of Paul and see what they all went through. And if tradition is right, then uh, only John died a natural death. The rest died violent deaths because of their preaching of the gospel. You must realize, too, that the apostles didn't just preach the gospel like gospel preachers do now or even inspired evangelists did then. They were eyewitnesses of the Christ of his resurrection. And thus they could say, as Paul reasoned, you know I'm an apostle. And he'll say, have I not seen the Lord? Well, nobody can say that today. So-called Jehovah's Witnesses don't even know the meaning of a witness. When they talk to me, sometimes I'll say to them, what does God look like? And they look at me like I'm crazy. Well, you said you're a witness. You know where a witness is. So if you're Jehovah's Witness, what does you look like? Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the gospel was the witness because it contains all of the evidence necessary to convince one that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. So that's why we preach the Word. And when you start, try to start giving other things or like people do in denominations, let me tell you what Jesus did for me. And then they start their testimony. Well, you're saying your testimony is better than the testimony of the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Matthew. No, the only real witnesses of Christ are the apostles of Christ, the ones he chose and the ones that he endowed to be able to do what he called them to do through the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. We have a little bit longer to go. I'll quit here in about five minutes. But our uh, some of the lessons that we might draw from Matthew, I don't pretend to say these are all of them, but some of them. Uh, our Lord was the proper descendant of King David and thus qualified to be heir of David's throne. Now, when you read Matthew, notice how much he deals with that kind of thing. That was very important to the Jews, and it was important to the fulfillment of prophecy and genealogy in the Old Testament. Uh, the fact that he was born of a virgin is sufficient proof that he was also the only begotten Son of God. Isaiah 7, 14 made it clear that he was born of a virgin. It was a sign. Well, somebody said, well, you can translate that word for virgin there to be young woman. As somebody said one time, well, I'd like to know how a young woman having a child is a sign of anything. That's what young women have been doing for ever since they've been having babies. No, it was the fact she was a virgin. Never knew a man. And Christ was conceived then by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, the writer of Hebrews says. And his faithfulness is our pattern to follow, our example to follow. Peter, in talking about suffering for the cause of Christ, says he's left us an example. Well, he's left us an example in every way when it comes to living how God wants us to live on this earth. Uh, his knowledge uh, of and his use of the Scripture kept the Savior from being tempted. And it'll do the same for every one of us. In the model prayer, uh, Jesus said we're to pray, lead us not into temptation. 
Well, that doesn't mean God's going to do it all for us. Rather obvious that Jesus was able to overcome temptation because he knew the word of God. So it's a combination of both. You can't expect, expect prayer to accomplish what the lack of study of God's word can. Any more than baptism for the remission of sins will substitute for observing the Lord's Supper as an act of worship on the first day of the week in the assembly of the saints. The truly happy man lives by the beautiful attitudes, the beatitudes of James, or rather that Jesus gave in, in Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that I labor on all my life is to try to have a beautiful attitude. And I don't sometimes. But it's something to work on, and I'm assured after this long that as long as you live, there'll be something to work on. The Bible is as an ocean in which a child can wade in, but no man can fathom. So there will always be something to challenge us. There will always be something to work on. And throughout all of those letters written to Christians on living the Christian life, one way or the other, by implication or explicitly in just so many words, he talks about self-control. So it's never a time that you accomplish it. Well, I've done it. It's over with. There's this constant effort to deal with it. And so he says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Chapter 5, verse 16. Um, sins of the heart of the inward man are to be destroyed, are to be fought against. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if you think bad thoughts, you'll be a bad person if you think on them long enough. Or at least you'll commit bad acts so we do our best to set our affections on things above. That doesn't mean we contemplate angels fluttering around in heaven. It means that we set our minds on things above by setting our minds on the truth of the New Testament concerning how we live. That's things above. And that's how we live. Now, it doesn't mean we don't think about heaven because we're saved by hope, Romans 8, 24. We expect what we have a right to expect. and We earnest desire to receive it. But we wouldn't know about it if we didn't know the Bible about it in the first place. So we seek to bring every thought and subjection to Jesus Christ, as Paul said. I used to say a long time ago when I spoke to young people, when I was somewhat of a young person, if you think that Christianity is old hat and doesn't amount to anything, you just decide that you'll go one day facing everything throughout that day, just like the Bible says you ought to face it and thinking just like you ought to think, and you'll see what a challenge it is to strive to live like Jesus Christ. So our goal is to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. Chapter five, verse 48. You say, well, that's impossible. No, it's not. Not through the grace of God given to us in the gospel and our belief in it because we strive with all of our might to do what God said, the way he said do it for the reason. There's more than one reason that he said do it. And guess what's going to make up the difference? You remember Paul praying three times and thorn in the flesh be removed from him? Well, it wasn't removed from him, but what answer did he get? My grace is sufficient for thee. Brother Roy Deaver used to say, back when people understood more about what it was to use a garden hoe, he said, uh, we're to hoe the garden as if it all depended on us and pray if everything depended on God. So we do all we can to love the truth, to obey the truth, to teach the truth, to defend the truth, bring our minds in subjection to Christ, but we're human. If we're saved, we'll be saved by the grace of God. We won't be saved by any meritorious thing. So what's going to make up the difference for the one who seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things are added unto us? It's going to be the favor of God. Covered by the blood of Christ, 1 John 1, 7. That's going to make up the difference. That's what the Christian has the world doesn't understand, is that we have that which makes the difference. We are in the favor of God. You ever been in somebody's favor? 
That means you may not deserve it, but he likes you and he's going to give it to you anyway. Well, that's not quite an example of what it is when it comes to the favor of God. So, um, uh, extends to us through the gospel. But it tells us what David said and Paul quoted in Romans. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute or reckon sin. I always ask the question, who is that man? For I want to be him. So there is somebody to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Who is that person? A faithful member of the church. Is he flawless? Flawless only because the blood of Christ makes him flawless. And thus, Matthew is showing what a king there is. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth. And lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Chapter 6, 19 through 20. And of course, we all know Matthew 6. Verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, our time has come to an end for tonight. We'll pick out some more of these lessons, uh, Lord willing, next week. And we should be able to uh, move on and get into Mark next week because these lessons, well, you can just go on and on with lessons. The more you uh, exhaust some of these lessons, the more lessons will stand out for you to use later. And this is, I think, in view of covering a lot of material, about the best way we can do this, as we sum it all up by getting an outline of the book, theme of the book, and seeing the lessons, at least some of them, that are given to us out of the book. So we'll call it quits for tonight. We really appreciate all of you being here. And hopefully, this COVID-19 mess will sometime end. Uh, I know it'll end I'm dead. I just don't want it to kill me right now. But uh, who knows what changes there will be that will not change, will become the new norm. Who knows? Who knows what will transpire before the summer's over? But here's one thing for sure. God controls it all, ultimately and finally. So let's pray that the thing will be gone, but end it with not our will, but thine be done. Be determined to be faithful no matter what happens.